food and we munch away. So I haven't had pumpkin pie in, in a while. So just putting that in there, it's always, it's always good if somebody you know, wants to bring a pumpkin pie or something. So that, that would be good. Um, and then next week, uh, John has an announcement that he's going to make real quick. Yes? I, I know nothing about it, so you don't want me to give the announcement. All right, so next Sunday, plan on staying after church, and how much is it for a meal? Or it's, what? it's free will donation. You don't get any better than that. And let me just tell you what my thought is on a free will donation for a missions project, that you give more than what a dinner would cost. Don't think, wow, I can come eat for a buck fifty. It's better than the casinos, okay? Come planning to give something uh, special uh, towards the speed the light thing. If you can do that, that would be great. Uh, but uh, plan on staying regardless. We want you to be a part of that. That'll be a, a good day. And then uh, the following week is Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day falls on a Sunday. Make your plans early. Uh, so that'll be a Valentine's Sunday. That's not just the wrong day of the week to have that, isn't it? But uh, uh, we're going to have here a, a, a dinner for our senior adults and it is for anyone 50 plus. So if you're 50 plus, you didn't know this, but you're a senior. It, I rebuke that. <clears throat> oh, because, because, because I know I'm almost 50. So. Huh. Oh, it's all relative. So anyway, the, uh, there's a sign up here, and we'll go ahead. John, if you want to grab that one. Here. We'll... Russ, you can grab that and get that going. John, you want to grab that one and get it started through your section? Make sure everybody has a chance to do that. That would be great. Uh, and go from there. All right. Well, today is a special day in our church. It's Baby Dedication Day. Uh, at Industry Assembly, we, we dedicate children to the Lord rather than baptizing them or sprinkling them as some other churches do, just as Hannah dedicated Samuel to the Lord and Joseph and Mary dedicated Jesus to the Lord, we believe that dedication more closely follows the biblical pattern uh, since there is not any uh, child baptisms or sprinklings listed in Scripture. So thus, a, a, a child's dedication ceremony uh, we don't believe that it imparts faith. We don't believe that it imparts forgiveness of sins. Uh, but rather, it's the parent's public acknowledgement that their child is a gift from God and that they have a spiritual responsibility for the Christian nurturing and training of that child. So, rightly understood, a baby dedication is really the dedication of the parents to the task that is before them. It is the parents who are pledging themselves today to obey the command of Paul, who in Ephesians 6.4 says, that tells parents to bring your children up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Deuteronomy in the Old Testament tells us, these commandments I give you today or to be upon your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. When is the proper time to teach your kids? All the time. It's the command of God that we should diligently seek to raise our children in a way as to lead them to trust God. Christ as their Lord and Savior. And today, we have a young couple presenting their first child, a daughter, to the Lord 
and dedicating themselves to the task. So I want to invite Jared and Nicole uh, to bring Hannah this morning. Uh, by the way, today is Jared's birthday, so he is 23 today. Or, no, wait, 32 today. So I can do that, so that makes me 25 instead of 52. I like that way. So do you have any, do you have family members that want to come and be a part of this as well? Because they are welcome. Do you have grandparents that want to come? Or, you know, you're all welcome to come. If you say, I want to be up there, you just come, okay? So, providing your family. All right. All right, let me see how she's going to do. We've been talking about, whoop. Oh, check out this pretty little dress. If you're friends with Nicole on Facebook, you have seen the most precious picture of, of Hannah in this dress. Oh. And I wouldn't open my eyes and look at these people either. So, you, is that offensive to you that she won't look at you? Do you want me to wake her up so you can see her? This is Hannah Jo Royer. She was born on November 5th. And she weighed 8 pounds, 9 and a half ounces, and was 21 inches long. So, isn't she, isn't she precious? You know, the family is an, a, a place that God ordained. From the very first family, God's the one who said, here's a man, here's a woman, here's a way to make children, have children. So God instituted family. He's the one that thought of it. He's the one that created it. So families are blessed and children are a heritage of the Lord. Committed by Him to parents to care, to provide, to protect, and to give spiritual training. So in this act of dedication, Jared and Nicole acknowledge these responsibilities. And they come before us today to dedicate themselves and Hannah to God for His will for her life and His will for their life as a family. Jared and Nicole have brought Hannah before us publicly today to dedicate her. And if you do not know their story, this is the baby they prayed for. This is the baby we prayed for. And right in God's perfect time, this baby was conceived. No problems in, in pregnancy. No problems in delivery. And that is a miracle all the way through. And so as a church family today, we, we celebrate too. That we get to be a part of this as well. Some of you will be her Sunday school teacher. You will be her youth leader or helper. You will be the one that uh, uh, helps her here and helps her there along life's path. Just because we're a part of church family together. So let me ask you guys a few questions. You guys can scoot up here. I'm, I won't hurt you. Okay? And I want you to answer these or affirm these by answering we will. Will you accept your God-given responsibility to raise Hannah in a Christ-centered home? Will you teach and discipline her in your home so that you are not solely dependent upon the church to impart biblical knowledge and spiritual values to Hannah? Will you make your life's choices based on what will benefit and strengthen the faith of your family and not upon secular trends or material gain? Jared as Hannah's father, will you give her the time and attention and affection that shows the true nature of her heavenly father? Nicole, as Hannah's mother, will you give her the special attachment she craves from you and the special nurturing touch that you are uniquely gifted by God to give her? And to the family that's here and to the family that's here, I ask you, as relatives, Will you conduct your lives in a way that will reinforce the biblical values so that Hannah can see by your life what it means to be a follower of Christ and the values that are being taught in this home? 
You can answer. And to our congregation, will you as the community of faith support Jared and Nicole and Hannah by Christian love and by the example that you set with your lives? I want all of us to stand this morning, if you would, as we pray for this family. Oh, always like a big stretch before I pray, too. She knows how I pray. She knows it's going to be long. (laughs) Dear Jesus, today, we thank you that you love our children. That even when you were on this earth and the kids would run to you and want to be around you, that you always made time for them. When the others said, oh no, Jesus is too busy, you scolded them, not the kids. You encourage them to come and be in your presence. I pray that for Hannah today. May she be a child of your presence throughout all of her life. I pray that you will set her apart throughout all of her life. I pray that your hand would be upon her. You have uniquely shaped her. You will uniquely gift her for your great purpose that you want to fulfill in her life. And I pray that she would see that, that she would know that, and that she would surrender her life to you and to your plan from a very young age. And Father, today we pray your blessing upon her. And I pray now for Jared and Nicole. God, I pray for the task that is ahead, a task that never seems to go away, that it's always there even at the most inconvenient times. I pray that you will give them strength. I pray that you will give them wisdom. I pray that they may know they can always turn to you through all of the ups and downs of life, that you will be there You will watch over their daughter. We thank you that you have entrusted this little girl to them. And I pray your blessing upon them, upon their home, upon their family. And I thank you for their family and friends that are here today. And I pray that as they have impact on Hannah's life as well, that you will help them to live their lives in a way that will show her that you are God all through her life. Father, we thank you now, and we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I could probably hold her and preach. But I'm going to give her back to Mom. And we do have, we have a couple gifts. These flowers are for you. We have a red flower for Jared, which represents the bloodline to the child. We have a white flower for Nicole, which, sang, which uh, signifies the purity of motherhood. And then we have the little rose bud for Hannah, signifying a new life that is just beginning. And one of my favorite things to do for kids is find them a Bible. And uh, so I went and got her a Bible, and uh, it's got some great pictures in it. And simply says, this Bible belongs to Hannah Jo, jo Royer. Uh, given by Industry Assembly of God on January 31st, 2016, on the occasion of her dedication service. So, may she hide God's word in her heart always. So, we love you guys. Many blessings. Can you help us just say thank you? Well, this morning I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4. If you would do that, I want to hear wrestling of pages. If you did not bring a Bible from home, we do have a few in the, the, under the chairs that you can, you can find and get there. This morning I want us to look at the story of Elisha and the widow and her sons that she helped that is found in 2 Kings chapter 4. Make sure that I'm on this morning here. How do I get there, Dave? Whoop. 
All right. Um, how many know that a good story has a problem and a way to fix it? Okay. Most of the, most everything we watch has a problem and a way to fix it. Okay. I grew up watching the Brady Bunch. Okay. Many of you can relate to that. Some of you are looking at me like saying, who? Okay. Before Disney Channel, the Brady Bunch. All of their problems could be solved in 30 minutes. It, just, it didn't matter how big the problem was. It only took 30 minutes. One of life's good lessons as you grow up is learning that my problems sometimes take longer than 30 minutes to fix. But this story is no exception. So this story has really four, at least four elements to it. Four parts to the story. There is a problem. We're going to call that the shocking snag. You ever have a snag in your life? Everything's just going along perfect. Well, maybe close to perfect. And all of a sudden, there's a little snag. Something's just not right. So we're going to call that the snag. But then we have the plan. How are we going to fix the problem? We're going to call that today the strange strategy. Then we're going to look at the solution. And we're going to call that the supernatural solution. And then we're going to look at the epilogue to the story. And we're going to call that the sufficient supply. So let's begin by looking at the first one here. Maybe. Boy, I don't know. There we go. The shocking snag. I want to read from 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 1, and it says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. So I want to go through this story kind of bit by bit this morning. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah. Now, in this story, it's the time frame of this is two great prophets in the land of Israel and Judah. Elijah and his trainee to start off with, Elisha. Eventually, this is, this is about 850 to 800 B.C., Elijah was an incredible prophet. He's the one who goes to Mount Carmel and, and there's a showdown. He's the one that builds an altar in the time of drought. He's the one who, who uh, pours water all over it and then prays a simple prayer and calls down fire from heaven. Tells people, choose this day. Who's the real, let's, let's have a showdown and see who the real God is. Elijah was a great prophet. Elijah was taken to heaven with a chariot of fire in a whirlwind. Elijah was allowed to see that, and because he was there and saw that, he was allowed his request to have a double portion of the Spirit of God that had been Elijah, that had been upon Elijah. So Elisha, and if you, if you ever look at the miracles and the things that happened in Elijah's life, and then you go to Scripture and look at Elisha's life, exactly double. Exactly. The miracles here are doubled here. How many know God is true to His promise? These men that are in this story were called sons of the prophet. 
Elijah and Elisha had taken young men and trained them to be men of God, men of God's Word. They were baptized and called sons of the prophet. They had families that they were taking care of. They were in the community teaching God's Word. And one of these men was a guy by the name of Obadiah. Now, it's not the other Obadiah in Scripture, but his name was Obadiah. And he was known to be a good man. In fact, he served in the king's palace as one of his administrators. Now, that brings us to the rulers of the day. The king of the land at the beginning of this story is King Ahab. King Ahab, well, First Kings says it this way, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. So out of all the kings of Israel, when it got to Ahab and Jezebel, Scripture tells us they're the worst. Together, they had attempted to persecute and kill every prophet and teacher of the law. So if you believed in God, they didn't like you. In fact, prophets were running and hiding. Some were killed. But they were running and hiding. And Obadiah was one of the men who said, I will help hide you. And he took 100 prophets and hid them in two different caves and he fed them and took care of them for a long length of time while Ahab and Jezebel were searching for them to kill them. Historians tell us that he even borrowed money. So he's got all these people to feed. And even though he worked for the king, go figure, he didn't have the money to continue to feed them. But they were God's prophet and he, he knew he needed to take care of them. So he borrowed money. Some historians say that he borrowed money from people who were the creditors to Ahab as well, who helped fund the kingdom. Which makes sense if he was a king's administrator, that he would have access to those bankers we would call. So out of his own pocket, he spends his money to take care of them, goes through what he has, and ends up borrowing money to take care of these men of God. So now this man dies. And his wife is left with his debt. And the creditor comes and says... Your husband died, and you now owe me the money that he owed me. So I, I don't have it. To which he can say, well then, you have two sons. And the law allowed that if you were owed, you could take sons, daughters, and you could make them your slave for up to six years to pay the debt. How many know this widow was probably having a bad day? My husband has died. Have mercy. But now, my husband left me with debt. He was a good guy trying to help God's people. And now I have this debt that I cannot pay. And they are now threatening to take from me really all that I have left that means anything to me, my two boys. So what does she do? She's smart. She says, you know what? My husband was a friend of Elisha, the prophet. In fact, there's a passage of scripture that shows a story between the two of them. They were connected and so she somehow has the thought, I'm going to the man of God. And she lays out her 
problem before him. My husband, who you know, you know why we have this debt, right? Because he was helping you and the other prophets. We didn't get into this mess because we were not financially smart. We got into this mess because we were trying to do God's work. What are you going to do, man of God? She, she needs help. I can't even imagine how overwhelmed this woman had to feel. Overwhelmed. So she goes. You know, as we look at that scenario, maybe you, already you've had the thought this morning, and that really seems unfair. It's really unfair that God didn't do a better job of taking care of her. No? For one, why did her husband have to die? He was a good guy. He was doing a good thing. And he's dead. Why would God do that? Why would God leave her with that kind of debt? Why would he make the creditor such a man that would want to come and take her children away? Why, God? You ever have those why God moments? Why, God? Why are we, why are we, we're trying, we're going to church, we're doing what we're supposed to do, and we still got problems. She'd come to the end of her rope. And Elisha says, how can I help you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? You know what that is? That's a man of God saying, I'm poor. Elijah and Elisha both were not known for having any worldly goods. They were poor prophets, as many of the prophets in the Old Testament were. Why is she going to him? I don't have a way to help you. I tell you what, what do you have in your house? You know what he's saying? What do you have that you can sell? What, what is that? Let's, let's go back to your house. Let's look at the stuff. We can get 10 bucks out of the TV. That rock over there, that ought to be worth five bucks. Okay, that's his suggestion here. What, what do you have? that's worth anything your servant has nothing at all except a small jar of olive oil you know I'm guessing that in her poverty she's probably already began to part with the things that had value we need food hey see if somebody will buy this cooking stuff Hey, see, see, we got a better pot. Let's take that pot and let's see if we can sell that pot because we need food. So when the man of God says, what's in your house? She says, and I meant to bring this up with me. All I have is a small container of olive oil. Now, that's what this is, is olive oil. It's what we use to pray for people. Scripture says if someone's in need, that you bring them forward and you anoint them with oil and that the prayer offered in faith will heal them. So that's why we anoint with oil because Scripture tells us to do it. It's not magical. It's just oil. Okay? But, th but in that day, olive oil had some value. And so she, the only thing she has of value is a small jar of olive oil. Now, the olive tree, I, don't, I did not know this, I had to look this up, okay, just so you know, wow, he's an expert on olive trees. <laughs> an olive tree will yield 10 gallons of oil a year. And in that day, they used it for medical purposes, lighting, uh, put it in your lamp and light it, cooking, uh, they even used it, women used it for cosmetics, 
Uh, it was put into the soap that they made. Uh, prophets, priests, and kings of Judah were all anointed with the finest of oils. Now, I want you to listen to how God used what the widow had with a very strange strategy. It says in verse 3, Elijah said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you, you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. Now, he perceives she has none. He didn't say, go home and take all the vessels that you have. He perceives she, if she does have any, it's not much. So he tells her. You know, why, why wouldn't he say, hey, go to your neighbor's. Ask for some beans and some rice. Ask for some cornmeal or flour. Oh, go to your neighbors and ask them for all the necessities of life. He didn't say that. He says, go to your neighbors and ask them for empty containers. Oh, uh, hey, uh, mom sent me. And uh, she wants to know... Um, you got any empty containers here? Huh? You know, you got, you, you got something that's empty. We, we just need empty containers. All right. What do you need empty containers for? Aunt Mom just says get empty containers. We need empty containers. So neighbors begin to give whatever they have. Empty containers. Take them home. Can you imagine what that house probably looked like? Can you imagine what that house probably looked like? This is me hitting the kitchenette here. So the widow goes home and she does exactly what Elisha has instructed. They knock on the doors, they get all the containers that they can get, and they go home and they shut the door. Now, he, did, he, he told them, don't just get a few. Get a bunch. Go to your neighbor's house and get some containers. Hey, you know what? That's probably enough. No. The prophet said, not just a few. Let's get as many as we can. So under the divine impulse of the prophets, who was directed to say this to her, who apparently could foresee that God was about to do something incredible, tells her, go get some pots, get them in your house. And that brings us to our supernatural solution. Verse 5 says, She left him, and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. So when they borrowed all the jars they could find, they go inside and they shut the door. Now, sometimes God does miracles in their public and everybody gets to see them. In this case, he didn't say, hey, can we borrow your pots and pans and come with me because we got something really good going on. No, it was just them. Even the prophet didn't witness this miracle. They had empty containers probably lined up anywhere and everywhere they could. Vessels of all shapes and sizes. Empty flower pots, trash cans wineskins, bowls, cups, pitchers, everywhere. And the widow picked up the small jar of oil that she had, and she began to pour into the first container. And it filled it up. 
And she went, still got the jar of oil. So she goes to the next container and she fills it up. She's still got joy. I bet it's at, I'm thinking at that point, she's finding the biggest one she has. I'm going to test this out. She goes to the, the mother load and she begins to pour. And it pours and it pours and it pours and it pours. I have a magic trick. We used it at VBS. It's an illusion where you take a cup of water. It's about this big. And then you have four other cups that just keep getting bigger. Some of you saw that. Uh, I almost brought it this morning and I thought, no, nah, I don't want to be distracted with that. But, but you take the little cup and you pour it into the next size cup and that cup ends up being filled. And then you take that cup and pour it into the next bigger cup and that cup gets filled. And then you take that cup and pour it into the next cup and that cup into the next cup and you have this cup that's this big that got filled with the water from that cup and all along the way it's completely filled. And then you take the big cup and then you fill all of the cups and you end up with all the cups with water in it. It's a great illusion, okay? But it's just a trick. And that's why I didn't bring it this morning, okay? I planned to bring it. And then I had the thought, you know what? I don't want anybody to think that God had an illusion, that God did a magic trick. When I do it, I can tell you there's a trick to it, okay? It's an illusion. And if you see it, you're going to say, oh, really? I fell for that? There's no illusion with God. There was no illusion with this miracle. As she began to pour, all of the vessels began to be filled. And it says that they just kept bringing them to her. Just kept bringing them to her. Imagine how her and her sons are now feeling as she's watching, as they are watching this miracle take place before their very eyes. It says, when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. The vessels ran out. Everything they had got was full. But the jar of oil still had more. Bring me more! Mom, there are no more! Can you imagine? She's looking, I, I can just tell you. Do we have anything in this house that has something in it? Oh, empty it. See that flower pot? Dump it out. Dump the dirt out of that. I don't care if those flowers are beautiful. I got a little more oil. Oh, too bad they didn't have a bathtub. Okay? Too bad there was no swimming pool in that day. Oh. The oil just kept coming and coming. She had never dreamed that she was going to be striking it rich from the oil that she already possessed. But there it was. And she had nowhere left to pour. And only then did the miracle stop. And the widow and her sons probably had to look around and marvel at how incredible God was. All of that oil came from that little container. And we see the sufficient supply. Verse 7 says that she went and told the man of God. Now, is that any surprise? Can you imagine they were telling... I'm guessing they were probably telling everybody. Well, maybe not everybody, because everybody would want to come and get some oil. Hey, I need my pot back! <laughs> right now, with the oil in it! But she runs and tells the man of God. And he says, now go and sell the oil and pay your debts. And you and your sons can live on what's left. See, God had delivered them in a miraculous way. The widow runs to Elijah. She tells him. And he says, go. Not only will there be enough 
to pay the debt and get that creditor off of your back, but there will be more than enough for you and your two sons to live. They would be able to be taken care of. What an incredible day for the widow and her sons who had been faced with an overwhelming circumstance. When she went to the man of God, she was overwhelmed. What are we going to do? They're going to come and take my children away. I, I don't have anything. And now, everything has changed. And she knows there was no way of getting around this. There was no way of getting help. There was nothing I could have done. But God showed up and took care of me. All the widow owned was that little jar of oil. But God was able to use what she had and, and was able to take it and use it in a way that it would be more than enough. God definitely went above and beyond what her and her sons could ever imagine. It's a great story. I love telling stories from the Old Testament that, that God has given us and left us. But may we never just look at one of those great stories and say, great story. Because the reason he left those stories for us is so that we can glean from them something that will help us now. This was almost 3,000 years ago. And yet we can still find help in this story. We, we can take this story and the first application that we can make is that when we are in need, we need to go to God. When we face problems in life, we need to go to the source who can help us. How many times in our lives do we need help? Are we not people who need help? We are. And this story reminds us that on those days when we're having the why God, why am I going through this? That God's big enough to say, I got you. I got you. And you know what he wants to teach us in those moments? I've always had you. I've always had you. You know, God really wants us not just to call out to him in those moments, but every moment. Why are we creatures who call out to God when the airplane's going down, but ignore him when things are going great. It's true. When life comes at us, we're the first to call the prayer chain. But when things are going good, sometimes we're the first one to say, you know what, I don't need to go to church. Things are going really good. I don't need to get up and pray. I don't need to read my Bible because things are going good. I got this. And God wants us to know, I'm there for you every day. Every day. We also can take this story and make a second application. That when these things happen, it builds great faith in us to know God will take care of me. God will take care of me even if he has to do it miraculously. Some of you need to hear that again. God will take care of you, even if he has to do a miracle to take care of you. We serve a miracle-working God. 
And the same God that stepped into this story and helped the widow is the same God with the same power who still does it today. I'm amazed at people who say, well, God used to do that. To my question is always, what made him stop? God is God. He doesn't change. If he's a healing God, he's a healing God forever. He doesn't change because we say, well, I, he didn't heal my grandma. And so therefore, my grandma died when I was three. And, and so God is not a healing God. Listen, we all have an appointment with death. It is the result from when sin came into the world. We all have a limited time on earth. Plain and simple. You look at Lazarus in the Bible, who Jesus rose from the dead. Guess what's wa what was waiting for him? He had to die again. Why? Because we are human. We have a life span. And even good people die. Even good people die young. You should write a song about that. You must be old if you got that. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply every need according to His glories and riches. God wants to take care of us. Even if it's miraculous. Even if you say, well, He didn't do that. Well, maybe there was a reason. I promise you, there was a reason God didn't heal my grandma. I don't believe it was because heaven needed another angel, because we're not going to be angels in heaven. Okay? The angels already exist. That job is taken. He didn't need another, another rose in his rose garden in heaven. Okay? There's all kinds of things we say to comfort ourselves when people die. Many of them are not scriptural. Okay? You, what, what is scriptural? When you die, you will continue to live in eternity in one of two places based on what you did with Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. That's it. Man, that's not very popular to preach. It's not. But it's true. That's what the Bible teaches. That's why so many people want to say, well, the Bible, we can't count on it anymore. Because it hurts my feelings. It doesn't agree with me. It doesn't matter what we believe. It matters what Jesus says is truth. He says, you want to come to heaven? You want to come to the Father? The only way to Him is through me and what I'm going to do for you on the cross. It's the only thing. Jesus wants to take care of you. Even if He has to do the miraculous. And do you know what the greatest miracle of your life will be? It will not be that God healed you from cancer or a tumor or some disease. The greatest miracle, if you go to heaven, the greatest miracle of your life will be salvation. That God took you a sinner and when you cried out to Him, He heard you, and He forgave you, and He applied the blood that was shed on the cross over your sin so that you can have eternal life with Him forever. I don't know what you think, but let me just stop to tell you, that's good preaching. Some of you, you won't say it to me, so I'll tell you. That's good preaching. If you won't amen me, I'll just tell you. That's good preaching. We need to hear the truth of God's Word. 
Now the third and final application that we can make, and this is the one that I really want us to see, but if you're here this morning and you need one of the others, we're here. But here's what I want us to see. God is looking for vessels to fill. I want you to say that with me. God is looking for vessels to fill. Now, in the Bible, oil is always a symbol of the Holy Spirit. When we anoint someone with the oil, it is a symbol of the Holy Spirit that is going to come and do that work in their life. When a king or a prophet or a priest was anointed to serve, it was a symbol that the Holy Spirit was coming upon them and was going to be upon their life. It was symbolic so people could see, experience, and feel this is real. So he gives us something real to show us this is just a symbol of what is really going on. It's not the oil that heals. It's the Holy Spirit that heals. We are Pentecostals. If you did not know that this morning, you have stumbled into a Pentecostal church. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit and that no one comes to Christ without the Holy Spirit first drawing him. No one, everyone in this room that is a believer, you are a believer because God sought you. Not because you, oh no, I went and found him. No, no. He was seeking you and drawing you, and that's how you found him. Every one of us are drawn to the Father, scriptures, Scripture tells us. We believe that when we give our life to Christ, that the Holy Spirit resides inside of us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. That Christ lives in us. That's the hope that one day we're going to spend eternity with Him forever. But He comes to dwell inside of us. That's why many times we hear a sinner's prayer that says, Lord, I invite you into my heart. I invite you into the center of my being. He comes to live there. But we also believe that there is an infilling of the Spirit that gives us power. Jesus told His disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. And then He lists where they're going to be. All around the world. He said that right before he was taken up to heaven. You flip to the next chapter of Acts, and it says that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. It wasn't something they did. The Holy Spirit was filling them. In a couple chapters over, in Acts chapter 4, it says, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the Word of God with boldness. Acts chapter 13, it says, The disciples were continually filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. I love that one. I do. So for Christians who run around like it's the end of the world, lighten up. Be filled with the Spirit because it will bring to your life joy unspeakable and full of glory. Ephesians 5 contains this imperative from the Apostle Paul. He says, do not get drunk on wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. I have a friend that preaches a message on you need to be drunk in God. Now, I've heard it, and I have never been a drinker. That is something that I have problems, but that is something I have never struggled with. I've never had a sip of alcohol in my life. 
So when I listen to that sermon, it's like, it really doesn't affect me, okay? Uh, so for those that maybe you have, you've drank, and you understand what it is to be drunk, and he says, you know how you get so full of the, the, the alcohol that it consumes you and you change? He says, that's what we need with God. We need to be full, so full of the Holy Spirit that it changes us. Now the good thing about the Holy Spirit is it's not going to turn you into someone you don't want to be. It's going to turn you into someone who is Christ-like every single time. Every single time. The point we need to be vessels who will be filled. We need to be vessels. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasures in jars of clay. Let me just tell you, he's talking about you. Your body is clay. It's dirt. Okay? It's been fashioned together. God breathed into man the breath of God, and we became a human race at that point. But take all of that away. When you die, you die, you're going to be cremated and spread out somewhere, or you're going to be buried in a box and put back into the dirt, and eventually you'll become part of the dirt again, your physical body, okay? We are an element of the ground. And God says, into that human clay pot, I'm going to put this treasure, my presence, my spirit. Because my presence inside of human form, which is frail and fails, is going to show that this all-surpassing power is from God, not from you. So when God fills you with, your, with, this, with His Holy Spirit, He's going to change you so that people see Him, His power, His glory. Because they're going to know there's no way John catch that good. There's no way he has that kind of power. There's no way he can be that loving or that forgiving or that kind or that patient. There's no way he can be that long-suffering. There's no way he can be that gentle or meek. There's no way he can have that kind of self-control. And the truth of all of that is, yes, you're right. In, on my best day, I always fall short. But on his worst day, he doesn't have a worst day. His power in me is a witness to everyone around that it's his power. It's his glory, his spirit that lives in this clay pot to show the world Him. You are an earthen vessel. And what you decide to put into your earthen vessel is your choice. You know, we're the only part of creation that has free choice. You have free choice. I can choose to serve God. I can choose not to serve God. That's your choice. God gives every human that choice. He doesn't strong arm us. He doesn't, he doesn't put our arm behind our back until we say, Uncle, he's a gentleman waiting for us to choose to love him. Our loving Heavenly Father gives us choice. And then every day we get to choose, what am I going to put into my earthen vessel? Am I going to put God's Word? That would be a good thing. Why should I read my Bible every day? Because you're an earthen vessel. You're a clay pot. In fact, let me just tell you, you're a crack pot. That's, you don't, don't say good preaching then. Don't, don't, sorry. But it's true. We are leaky pots. We're leaky buckets who constantly need more. 
every day, God says, my mercies are new every morning. You know why he says it? Because every morning you need new mercy. You need that every day to meet with him, to have time where you're spending time in his presence, saying, God, fill me today with you. Fill me with your word. Speak to me in my quiet time. Help me throughout this day. Keep things out of me that shouldn't be there. I was going to say donuts, but that may not be. I don't know. For some of us this Christmas season, we've had more donuts than our fair share. God has an incredible plan for your life. And he wants you to know you are a vessel. You're a vessel. And he wants to fill you with himself. So bring your vessels, not a few. I've been singing the old hymn uh, all yesterday. If you were around here, you heard me singing that song throughout the church. Don't bring just a little bit. Bring all of it. Don't. Bring all of it. God's source is never ending. As long as you have room to receive it, He will keep pouring Himself into you. Every day. The only thing that stops is when we say, no thanks. I'm done. That was enough. God, it's Sunday. I'm here. Fill me up. It's my gas station day. I'm here for my spiritual fill up. And that should be enough to get me till next Sunday. Lord, I'm back. It's another Sunday. First day of the week. Fill me up. When he wants us to say, Sunday morning, fill me up. Monday morning, fill me up. Tuesday morning, fill me up. Wednesday, hump day, Lord, fill me up twice. Thursday, fill me up. Friday, when we're all, I can't wait till the weekend, fill me up. Saturday, fill me up. And guess what happens if we do that? When we come to Sunday, we're not coming in needy. Because we're already filled up. You can't imagine how this place would change if you came filled up on Sunday morning. If you didn't come, oh, when the saints come dragging in. You know? When I was in high school, uh, we played this song that started off, but it was when the saints come marching in and it, started off, it was a, a New Orleans thing, and it, it started off dragging, really dragging. And then by the end of it, man, it's just kicking in in, in jazz town. Uh, but it's like, that's sometimes the picture of us on Sunday morning. We come dragging in and we pray, God, I need something. Let the songs, let, you know, and by the time we leave, we say, oh, it was, it was good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. But listen, if we can grasp this thought that we are clay pots that need filled every day our lives will change I believe that we need to bring our vessels whatever we have you know there's the thought of bringing an empty vessel and that's really not the picture that the picture that they brought they had they had empty vessels and when Scripture talks about us being the empty vessel, here's the picture that I have of it. Because if God fills me today, hopefully there'll be some left tomorrow. Hopefully there'll be, you know, there should be some residue left over there. So it's a continual fill that He wants to do. But what do I need to keep emptying? I need to keep emptying myself of me. Because we are creatures of selfish. And the biggest thing that gets in my way of being filled with Him <coughs> is me. What I want. The 
the things that I hold on so tightly to. And when I can let go of them and say, Lord, I empty myself of me so there is more room for you. That's the picture of being an empty vessel. Empty ourselves so that He can fill. You know, we live in a day when people are far more concerned about keeping their vehicles filled with gas than they are keeping their spirits, their earthen vessels filled with Him. It's true. Even in Christian circles, we talk more about the price of gas and getting gas in our vehicles than we do about being filled with God's Spirit. You are an empty vessel. Will you let him fill you this morning? Here's what I want to do today. A little bit of time. But I want to break this down into the three things. One, you're saying, you know what, I have a great need in my life today. I stand like the widow and have a miracle that I need whether it's a miracle of provision or a miracle in your body or maybe someone in your family needs a, a miracle. You know, both, just immediately think of you guys, both have parents that are physically needing a, an incredible miracle from God. Both sides of the family in great need. God wants you to know this morning I'm going to provide for you, even if it takes a miracle to do that. And maybe you're one that says, you know what, I need, I need that faith to rise in me, that, that I would just know God's there. I just need that reminder that God's there. That faith would rise in me to know he's there. He's got this. It doesn't have to be a, it doesn't have to be a crisis moment in your life, is what I'm saying. Well, maybe you don't have that great need, but you say, you know what? I need the Holy Spirit every day. Every day I need him to fill me. today, here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to have you bow your heads. I'm not going to have you close your eyes. I'm going to have you stand up and walk to this altar. Because I believe that God's going to meet us right here. Okay, your step of faith today is literally going to be a step of faith. Okay, the, the widow had to do something. Okay? He didn't say, go home and do nothing. I'll take care of it. He told her, I need you to go home and get to work. He gave her something to do. I'm giving you something to do. To stretch your faith and say, I'm in. And I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to the altar. That's my step of faith this morning. Saying, God, he may give you more instructions. He may say, I need you to do this or I need you to lay that down. I need you to pick this up. And that's between you and him. But today it starts with saying, God, I am going to respond to you. Maybe you're here today and you say, I, need, I just need Jesus. I, I just need Jesus. I, I, I stumbled into this place and I don't even know him, but today I know, I know I want him. I encourage you, come to this altar. Cry out to him in this place. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter to me what you want to come forward to. If the Holy Spirit is drawing you and saying, you need to respond to this. I just want this place to be filled with us. Just like I have laid out all of these vessels. I want this altar to be filled with vessels where we come and say, Lord, I'm going to empty myself so that you can fill me with your presence. Come, let's fill this altar this morning.